Good morning to all of you and what a pleasure to be here at the IA in 2022, four years after our last industry gathering. I will talk about powertrains today for heavy duty trucks, which is a very focused subject to talk about, but a lot of things are going on and I think you have seen here at the IA. We know that biofuels and batteries and hydrogen as a fuel or hydrogen for a fuel cell are very hot topics and they are on the tips of our tongues when we are debating the future of transport. And Andreas, who was here before, um, before the minister, uh, had a very you know, consistent view which we share on, on such you know, technology um, diversity in order to attach uh, the, the right solution uh, for the future. We at Iveco Group are fully committed to all various different versions of technology and propulsion technology because we don't know and the industry doesn't know what is the single, if at all, technology that will prevail in the years to come. Before I cover the subject, let me briefly introduce us uh, to you because we are kind of a new and an old uh, kid in town. Um, we have been founded like more than 150 years ago, but only very recently, January this year, we have spun off as Iveco Group from CNH Industrial, which is an agriculture and construction and commercial vehicle group. And we are solely listed at the Milan Stock Exchange since then. We are proud uh, owners of the various different famous brands that you can see here on the side. It's uh, Iveco Trucks and Bus. It's certainly also the FPT powertrain, which is the future propulsion technology branch that we have for our own as well as for third-party customer predominantly. We have a defense division, we have special heavy-duty trucks in there, and we have Magiro's firefighting vehicles, serving heroes since 1864. I will start my speech with being a bit provocative, yeah? and um, I like to do that at times. Um, this gentleman here on the page is, for those who don't know, it's uh, Rudolf Diesel. Yeah? And the word diesel has been uh, stigmatized in the last couple of years, if not months, I think not in a, in a right way. Um, and don't forget, I mean, the diesel engine in a commercial vehicle had more than 100 years to settle in, to find the perfect position, the perfect weight. Um, it's not yet perfect, actually, cost and functionality. And whatever you will see on the booth of whomever, including us, is not going to be a perfect continuation of a diesel technology. The diesel itself as a fuel, when it's fossil, that shall be stigmatized and has to be replaced. But the diesel cycle, which is a combustion cycle, is something that is there to prevail. For renewable fuels or biofuels of whatever share and form, this is going to play a role in the decarbonization of transport. The answer is not 100% battery. It's certainly also not 100% fuel cell. It will be a combination of these three technologies of renewable fuels, battery, as well as fuel cell. So whoever thinks that the transition away from this dominant technology that has been with us for more than 100 years will go fast and flawless, and you just need to put tougher targets in place, so just to make sure folks uh, run harder, and you know, have basically a truck at a similar payload at lower cost is either naive or not from this industry or not from this planet. Some want to work with rocket fuel like liquid hydrogen, so be it. So, we will certainly start with, with gauges and then we will see what comes, what comes next. In order to paint the picture a bit of the challenges that we have, you might not really see what's on the top left, but just the top left is the earth warming, the famous two degrees centigrade or one and a half degrees centigrade earth warming that we need to bend. The curves point up, they don't bend. We need to bend them. No way around that. And we have to deploy every measure that is in our force to actually bend the climate curve. At the bottom left, you see the cake of all the CO2 emissions in our, in our not only commercial vehicle, in the entire industry. You see 23, 28% are actually from the energy sector, 22 are from transport, and five percentage points are from heavy duty trucks, which is a big, big share. I'm not playing this down, but again, well to wheel, which is on the right side of this page, is the way to think. It cannot be that the focus is only on tailpipe emission. This is plain, plainly wrong. Because only looking at play, uh, a tailpipe and only looking at a battery electric solution, not looking where the energy comes from, you know all the saying, yeah, is not working and it doesn't answer 
the question that is in front of us, which is around climate change, which has to be well-to-wheel thinking and really fully circular. Otherwise, you know, we do the wrong thing. And if we rush too much into batteries, we are driving Europe into another dependency on raw materials. If we rush in Europe into renewable fuels, we have other de dependencies. And the same is for, for fuel cells. We need to have all three technologies alike because Europe has now a historic chance to become energy, let's say, more energy independent than we are today. From may it be gas, may it be fossil fuel, whatever it is. And I think uh, the call for action to the politicians is to be smart and intelligent about how we're going to structure the energy independency of Europe, hence to facilitate technology solutions of various different kinds in an industry like ours in order to see what will be the best and balance the different technologies one against the other in order to avoid new dependencies. So what are the solutions for heavy duty transport? Certainly internal combustion engines and renewable fuels. Um, that's uh, what you can see here on the page, as well as on the battery side, we are working on these as well, as well as on hydrogen, which has two types. It can either go through a fuel cell to propel, propel the truck electronically or electric, and or you can have a, a combustion engine uh, running on hydrogen. Um, and we, in, in, in Iveco Group, we have been pioneers in biomethane. I think four years ago, for those of you who have been around, the entire booth of Iveco was in fact about gas, gas at that time. And this is the only available alternative with diesel-like performance today in order to go CO2 neutral, when it is biomethane and renewable methane. Yeah? And the costs today of a biomethane kilo is still at around more or less one kilo, so that, uh, sorry, one euro per kilo. These, these prices are still very, very competitive. But, you know, there is not enough biomethane to power all the vehicles. This is very, very clear. But there are applications in our industry where battery electric makes no economic sense and fuel cell certainly neither. And when we think about agriculture applications and you need to power a harvester on a field, that harvester has to perform on the day when the sun is shining, when you have to harvest. You cannot charge a battery or see whether the fuel cell that you last time looked at last year is still working. This is impossible. And hence, for agriculture and construction equipments, our powertrain division is continuing to develop combustion cycle engines with renewable fuels, liquid, gaseous, all the way to hydrogen. And we have, you know, on our booth, the latest 13 liter engine that can burn them all in a CO2 neutral way. That's important. That's where we want to come to. Similarly, we've just announced a partnership in India. They go LNG, liquefied natural gas, obviously, because that is from an economic and from an environmental point of view, when it's done the right way, way superior to fossil diesel. And then here there is a tendency in India, which is already very strong in China, where LNG at times has made up up to 20% of the on-road um, transport in heavy duty trucks. So talking about battery electric vehicles, so you may wonder, like, he's always talking about combustion engine. I mean, how yesterday is this guy? No, I'm not. I mean, we need to be reasonable. We need to look at what reality is and not follow any extremist position. We have electric vehicles on our booth, and we have started um, the second generation of our electric daily uh, production, basically, today. Well, the electric daily is a quite successful vehicle. It's fully modular. You can see it on the booth. You can get it with one, two, or three batteries. And even we are pioneering now in this vehicle segment the application of a hydrogen fuel cell where we work together with our uh, friends and partners of Hyundai Motors uh, with a Nexo fuel cell inside the daily. You can visit it on the booth, including a range for a 7.2 ton GVW vehicle of up to 400 kilometers, not only for range, but also to power all the PTOs that this vehicle has. We are fully behind battery electric. But again, it doesn't make sense everywhere, okay? On the right-hand side, you see the Nicola Trey BEF, which is, in terms of kilowatt hours, at least what I have seen here, the, the, by far the largest, with the by far largest range. Um, and it, you know, has its charging time cycles, as we discussed or heard before. If you charge it with megawatt, it goes fast, but show me a megawatt charger, it doesn't exist. And if you have, I mean, it doesn't exist at scale. And if you take, for example, this vehicle, 740 kilowatt hours, and you charge it with 300 kilowatt charger, you need two hours in order to have a decent load, which is for some applications suitable, but not for all. And if you have 10 of those trucks, one next to the other, you charge them from zero ground up, 
the power you need with 10, 350 kilowatt chargers is about the energy that our Iveco plant in Madrid consumes. You know? Just to give you an idea of the size of power that this vehicle and the charging will need. And then think of 50 power chargers, megawatt chargers at the truck stop in Germany or wherever. If you have these trucks on this truck stop charging from ground up, the lights around the villages around the truck stop will just go off. And this is true for Europe in, as a whole. It's certainly true also for Germany. It will remain a depot charging solution in certain spots, but not in the broad field of commercial transport. I don't see that coming, but we are there. And if it comes, we can prepare. But I don't see it. It's just logically wrong. Um, when you go to fuel cell, as I said, when you need more range, more distance, it's the e-daily fuel cell that we are doing with a small series next year to see how this goes, but only in the heavy part. And we have the fuel cell nickel electric um, production version actually here on the booth, which is a fully modular platform with the battery electric one uh, that is as well on the booth as a 4x2 as you can see. This vehicle can carry 70 to 80 kilograms of hydrogen, gaseous 700 bar, and it has a range of up to 800 kilometers, which is fine. Yeah? When you have four hours of driving, a break, four, uh, sorry, four, yeah, four hours of driving, break, four hours of driving, this works, yeah? so it, it's okay. And the roof refueling time will shall be up to 20 minutes. Similar to megawatt chargers, refueling stations that fill this beast in 20 minutes are neither existing at scale at this point, just to be clear. So megawatt chargers as well as refueling stations are a key imperative for the industry, for the industry around us to create, to facilitate these vehicles on the road and uh, make them useful for our customers in a fully circular economy. All of this costs a ton of money. These electric trucks, and you might, some of you might have asked the OEM, so what does this truck cost? What does that electric? Yeah? What is the price of those? And you hear price tags, 400,000 euros, 600,000 euros. You hear huge price tags. Small and medium-sized fleets will never, will never shift to technologies and vehicle prices like that in a traditional uh, leasing model or a traditional financing model. The balance sheets just won't hold it. It does not work. So the future, and I took the liberty to wear the t-shirt of Gate here at the stage, I hope it's okay, is we will bundle all of these things into a pay-per-use model. In the end, it is going to be a long-term rental offering that we make to customers where you get the vehicle for three or five years with a minimum mileage of 150, 180,000 kilometers a year, and you can choose whether you want the energy inside or you want to source it, source it separately. You will get toll collect and everything else in a bundled offer. And with that, it becomes very comparable to diesel. And with that, this technology is going to be commercialized at scale. It does not make sense to only have electric trucks purchased by subsidies, by public subsidies, to become status symbols of fleets. Then I can sell easily two here, five there, but we will never scale. And our industry, heavy-duty trucks, if you count all the trucks in Southern Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, we have probably two and a half million heavy-duty trucks running. If by 2025, all of us, I call OEMs, yeah, starting to put 5%, 8% of our heavy-duty trucks as electric, and then we gradually ramp it up to 2030 when we need to hit a 50% minus CO2 target, that is likely to come, very likely, we will put maybe 25, 30,000, 40,000 trucks per year in operation, which means out of the two and a half million trucks that are running today, maybe 10%, maybe 15% will be electric by the end of the decade. The contribution of that to bend the climate curve on CO2 is there, but it's, to be honest, tiny. It doesn't change anything at scale. And hence, we need to go after renewable fuels, CO2 neutral fuels, because they are available basically today. We need to push them in order to bend the climate curve. Anything else, just running after batteries, as wrong as you know, running after another technology. We need all three of them to bend the curve, and we need new ways to commercialize these vehicles, which we call gate. And I'm sure the other OEMs will come up with something similar, and they call it differently. Visit our booth. Um, we have all what I said on the stand. Grab me if you want to talk, and uh, happily 
take your questions at the booth, which is not possible here today. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you found it a bit interesting. It's not easy being the first person to go right before the lunch break. We are going to take a quick one hour break for lunch. I encourage you to come back, whether you're joining via live stream or here on the main stage. We have Martin Daum of Daimler Trucks coming up at one o'clock. And trust me, you won't want to miss that keynote. I'll see you then.